Good evening, everyone. Breaking news. Disaster on Isfahan 5. Reports from the sector show that Warmaster Horace Lupercal has enacted a mass shooting on three of the Emperor's Astartes legions, leaving tens of thousands of legionnaires dead. Eyewitness accounts claim that a second wave of loyalist troops cooperated with traitor legions to cripple the Salamanders, Iron Hands and Raven Guard legions, opening fire on the soldiers instead of assisting in their retreat, leading many to speculate what could have caused Horace to commit such heresy. One of the most infamous events to occur during the Horace heresy the drop site massacre would forever change the fate of not just the Space Marine Legions, but all of human history, its effects echoing 10,000 years into the grim dark future. After the Emperor of Mankind received word of Horus virus bombing the planet of Istvan III, he had sent seven Space Marine Legions to the Istvan system to subjugate Horus's rebellion. However, the Emperor was unaware of just how deep the corruption went as four of the seven legions he had sent to neutralize Horus were already allied to the ruinous powers. On the surface of Istvan V, the openly traitorous legions of the World Eaters, Death Guard, Emperor's Children, and Sons of Horus waited in fortified positions at the bottom of a canyon known as the Urgal Depression. From the sky landed seven legions of loyalist Astartes divided into two waves for the assault. Wave 1 consisted of the Iron Hands, the Salamanders, and the Raven Guard. Their mission was to secure the drop site for further reinforcements. They achieved their goal, although the price they paid was heavy. As the first wave of Loyalists began to suffer attrition, they would pull back into Allied lines, secured by the second wave of attackers. This second wave of troops consisted of the Alpha Legion, the Night Lords, the Iron Warriors, and the Word Bearers. Together they would give the first wave enough time to rally and push deep into the Urgal Depression, slaughtering traitor scum until the canyon drowned in blood. Well, that was the plan. As the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard began to take heavy losses, they fell back to the drop site where the second wave of Astartes would regroup with their allies. That's when the massacre began. Suddenly, thousands of bolter shells flew through the air, tearing apart the first wave legions. They were under fire, but not from the traitors they had retreated from, but from their allies at the drop site. Soon the message was clear. The second wave of Astartes had betrayed the Emperor and their battle brothers. The three first wave legions scrambled under the overlapping fire and artillery from both sides, their forces shred apart by their former allies. The leaders of the three legions, the Primarchs Ferris Manus, Vulcan, and Corvus Corax, scrambled to act. Ferris Manus and the Iron Hands dug into a valiant defense, their leader being lost in a duel against Fulgrim, the Phoenician. Their losses were said to be down to a man, leaving the Iron Hands in shambles. While the Salamanders fought desperately alongside the Raven Guard, their leader, Vulcan, vanished beneath the storm of gunfire, leading the remaining Primarch, Corvus Corax, to declare the battle as lost, and ordered the Raven Guard to fight their way out of the crossfire alongside the Salamanders. Hundreds of thousands of Astartes lay dead in the sands of Istvan V, and with them, all hope for a unified humanity. The losses the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guards suffered that day proved to be so great that these legions never recovered their full strength after 10,000 years. This led them to be known as the Shattered Legions, their numbers thin, but just as capable as any other legion on the battlefield. Each legion had come to split their forces in compliance with Rabute Gilliman's Codex Astartes, yet the number of successor chapters each legion spawned is shadowed greatly by their brother legions. Today we'll look at five successor chapters of the Shattered Legions that caught my eye and how I painted and converted them. As my other videos in this series, the audio will cover bits of lore concerning the chapter, while the visuals will usually cover what I'm doing step by step. We'll uh, aim for a painting standard that would help one paint an army of these marines in a reasonable amount of time. As far as I'm concerned, if you want them to look better, you can use these methods and then build off of them. But if you're looking to pump out like a, like a whole table of like 30 of these guys, this will do you just fine. As for the level of conversion work I'm going to be doing on these minis, I'll aim for a sergeant in terms of aesthetic, 
I found that this is a good basis to shoot for as the converted design can act as a guidance of sorts both for standard infantry and leader conversions. And on one last note, if at any point you enjoy the content, consider subscribing, uh, follow me on Instagram, and if you really like it, consider dropping me a dollar or two over at Kofi. Um, buying these models uh, definitely builds up for someone who is as broke as I am, and I appreciate any help. But don't feel pressured. Uh, I don't want to pressure you into that, but I will pressure you immensely into enjoying this video. So enjoy. Or else. The Black Dragons are fleet-based salamander successors from the 21st founding, most known for their flaw in the organ that governs skeletal and muscular growth. The defective organ, the osmodula, osmodula, one of those, causes bony growths to grow out of the neophyte's arms and head. The head produces a solid bone crest and their canines grow long like fangs, while the arms grow blade-like appendages multiple feet long from the forearms. This level of mutation is just barely acceptable for many Imperial forces, like the Inquisition, although some Space Marine chapters, like the Dark Angels, refuse to cooperate with them entirely because of it. Some, like the Marines Malevolent, actively hunt down the Black Dragons, although the news of the Marines Malevolent being absolute cunts in general should not be surprising to anybody. That being said, the Black Dragons have quite a rap sheet having been active participants in the Third War of Armageddon and the Indomitus Crusade. At the cleansing of Cable, the Black Dragons were fighting Chaos Cultists, and they gave them the option to either fight them in 1v1 combat or jump into a lava-filled canyon. Between the option of jumping into lava or being face-fucked by Baraka, every cultist opted to jump. They also had a notable conflict with Dark Eldar who were interested in obtaining their Gene Seed flaw. After capturing a few Astartes, the Dark Eldar returned to Com... 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 Headquarters and succeeded in isolating the Osseo virus, as they called it. It was quickly weaponized, injecting a concentrate of it back into a black dragon. And uh, I'm just going to read it straight from the wiki. The twisted bone dragon that hatched from the unlucky donor's flesh was hung above the coven's chamber of whispers. Pretty sick. While one may believe that having giant blades growing out of your arms may lead to cumbersome operations of firearms and vehicles, the black dragons kind of have that covered. Marines with bony growths of sufficient uh, killiness are inducted into a special formation within the chapter known as Dragon Claws, which is what I opted to make today. These marines embrace their gene seed mutation, coating their arm blades in adamantium and donning a jump pack to quickly strike at vulnerable targets. Uh, just imagine the X-Men fastball special, except it's a squad of five or ten of them. Terrifying. Or possibly the coolest thing ever. I'm not sure. While I'm still thinking about it, why is it always adamantium? Why not other, like, metallic personality traits? A suit of armor made of pure belligerentium. The blade of melancholite. The metal club of hornium. For making a dragon claw, I wanted to try modifying the Primaris Mark X armor to look a little less Mark X-y. While the Black Dragons do have a picture displaying Primaris Marines for the chapter, which confirms that they do indeed receive Primaris reinforcements, I'm getting a little tired of seeing the Mark X's like, very distinct knees on every conversion. Like, that's what my eyes jump to, I see. Whenever I see, like, a, a conversion, I'm just like, let me see the knees, like some kind of fucking schizo. <laughs> Alright, side note from my script. It really bothers me, when, like, especially on Chaos Marines. When I see those Mark X knees... On Chaos Marine conversions, I go fucking ballistic. But anyways, adjusting the knees and trimming the gorget, I believe it's pronounced, gorget. It's something I see pretty commonly for people who try to modify their Primaris into like Mark 7 tacticals. So I wanted to try it out mainly just for the sake of it. I just think if I see those Primaris knees in a jump pack on the same model, my head is going to burst. 
uh, which is really bad timing on the script because Primaris Jump Units got announced like uh, four days ago. Regardless, it will leave me room to sculpt on the straps of the jump pack harness. When it came to the arm blades, I initially opted to use a wire armature mounted into the arm at an angle. Uh, I mixed green stuff and milliput in a 50-50 ratio and smashed it around a wire. The idea was to carve bone blades from this with the uh, metal rod in the middle, giving it a much more stability. However, it wasn't really working out. I tried carving them from the plastic, which wasn't working either, so I just settled on a roll of the combined putties. Uh, it turned out to work out beautifully, so I should have just done that in the first place. For the final modification of the arms, I added the little extra forearm armor that mounts around the base of the blade. Note that I didn't do this for the right arm. Uh, the right arm was a bit of an experiment because the left arm is shown to be like a long blade and the right one I want to see what kind of like a smaller cluster of shorter blades would look like and I imagine there'd be some variation about how the bones grow out so you know, I figured I'd just try it. With the bones done I slapped on some pauldrons and this particular one with a crux terminatus on it to kind of show his veteran status and the other one for the chapter heraldry which is a dragon's head. Uh, every chapter but one today will have an STL that you can get either for free or a few cents on the dollar so you won't have to worry about freehanding all these designs for an army's worth. I realize that some people will be very hesitant about trying freehanding so I'm going to try to do this in the future if possible. Another little bit of decoration I wanted to do was to add some dragon scales uh, mounted onto the armor. Um, as with my Elden Ring character build, I found the best way to get some decent looking scales is to just nut up and put them on individually. I realize there are some milliput mold presses that you can use as well, but they just don't really look good in my opinion, and I don't have one. So I just quickly knocked these out, maybe took me 10 minutes in total. It was slow, it was tedious, but didn't have to buy mold. And the final bit of modification I made for the conversion was to mount a skull on the jump pack for no other reason other than it looked cool. If you know how to paint black armor already, then 95% of the work of this model is going to just be doing the conversion. Uh, even then, if you're not making a dragon claw in particular, you could get away with smaller bone growths, which is even less work, but I digress. These days, I've been opting to use a black gray instead of a pure black for my projects, sometimes with a very tiny dot of neutral gray in it. If you paint black, you just hit the absolute lowest floor you can go in terms of like value. So I like using black gray because when I shade it, you can still actually discern panel lines and recesses. In general, I'm going to also opt to dry brush the model and use a lot of dry brushing for all the models today. Not only is this fast for army painting, but like I mentioned in other videos, um, I like the, I'm growing more fond with that slight dry brush texture on my Marines. Don't get me wrong, a nice clean paint job on a Marine is still really sexy, but Space Marines are just generally kind of big flat dudes and sometimes having a little bit of texture on those surfaces just gives me a little some visual something to chew on when I'm looking at it. Plus it's a bazillion times quicker in the long run to dry brush an army of troops rather than edge highlighting them all, but they're your models and you have a good gauge on whether or not you want to put in that level of effort. My personal advice, dry brush everything but then come back in with some edge highlights for your leaders and captains and all them. Uh, it'll look a little nicer while also being consistent with your army. The Black Dragon Dragon Claw blades of the Black Dragon Dragon Claw, holy shit that took me like nine takes, were painted in a standard bone color. Although that makes me question what color adamantium is in this universe, if coating them in adamantium doesn't alter the surface color, is it like an epoxy resin? Does it go on clear? Does it happen to be bone colored? What color is hornium? Painting bone tan onto straight black would take a while and be miserable, so 
I baste them with some brown first to make the tan application much easier, feathering in a bit of brown wash from the base to really sell the bone aesthetic. After washing the armor with black, I opted to just copy the green knee marking from the picture, mainly to save time, but an important note here is that I did the eyes in green right after doing the knees, which is in fact incorrect. The black dragons have red eye lenses, which you will see in the final spins, so just keep that in mind. While I opted to make a dragon claw just because they're fucking awesome and I'd kill myself if I didn't, these design decisions can be scaled down for troops with lesser mutations. Alternatively, give them some fancy accoutrements and whoa, you've got a jump pack captain or something. Either way, I hope this inspires more people to start Black Dragon armies because my fucking god, these guys are just so fucking cool. If there were ever a chapter that more blatantly shouts, please use us for a kill team squad, then these guys would be it. A product of the Ultima founding debuting in 8th edition, the Necropolis Hawks are 100% Primaris Marines who are trained in the art of urban warfare. Everything from their war gear to their chapter colors, reflect their ability to skillfully wade into the dust and debris of fallen buildings and eradicate any enemy they encounter. For this, the Necropolis Hawks have earned a reputation for no-nonsense surgical precision and pragmatism. This skill set came into great importance during the War of Beasts in the Vigilus campaign. During the campaign, there was an outbreak of Gellerpox infected in a hive city. The Necropolis Hawks chapter master... Uh, Raquelon Xantus? What the fuck is up with these names? Enforced a brutal and efficient quarantine zone around it, which slowly enclosed around any and all mutants in the area, in spite of the Hive World's labyrinthian design. For the Necropolis Hawk, I wanted a dynamic shooting pose, using a pistol-wielding arm from the easy-to-build Assault Intercessors. Combined with the left arm from the regular Intercessor kit, makes for a pose where the Marines' rifle may be low on ammo, and as we all know, Remember, switching to your pistol is always faster than reloading. I do have one small problem with the pistol arm, is that when it's attached, flush to the body, the Marines' aim is crooked, and it, I don't know, it didn't look right as a pose. I realize it makes sense for the model, but it didn't look right to me as a pose. Yes, I realize that doesn't make any fucking sense, but uh, I decided to... Uh, just glue it to the body at an angle and then fill the gap with green stuff to make the pistol more vertical. With that done, I slapped on some extra pouches to give a little extra tact cool to the city fighting specialists. At some point, I had some spare green stuff as well that I used to hang some decorative rope as well, but I didn't film that, so get fucked, nerds. I also really wanted to give them like the Death Watch shotgun. But I realized I used that on my Death Watch kill team already, and I was so hyped to give this guy a shotgun, uh, and then I realized I used it, and yeah, that was, a <laughs> that was a little depressing. While I'm keeping the actual conversion for the Necrohawk simple, the Hawks have a impressively in-depth uniform guideline for such a minor chapter. Uh, to summarize it, where was I? Oh, right. So, the Necropolis Hawk consists of a dark, grayish teal on the body with the arms and power pack being white. The helmet is variable, but since we're aiming for a sergeant, we'll be doing a red helmet with a white faceplate. I started by smashing on a grayish blue onto the torso of the armor. This was highlighted with some white mixed into it and then dry brushed on. In retrospect, the blue is off, but I will be readdressing this later. 
Um, next step was to paint some light gray onto the arms, the power pack, and faceplate, and then paint a dark gray onto the weapons and joints. From here I loaded my brush with white and dry brushed the entire model, hitting every edge regardless of the color underneath. After that I moved to base coating the red and browns, although if you want your brown to have some highlights on it, do the brown before dry brushing. I didn't, because I'm winging this, and yeah. At this point I mixed the new Nuln Oil and some glaze medium one to one and washed the entire mini. While my plan was to dilute the wash, making for a smoother application, and to not darken the teal down too much, the torso and legs were looking a little brighter than intended to at the end of this. I either needed to mix a dot of gray into the base coat or do a stronger wash here, maybe mixing black and blue together to get the base coat I wanted. I tend not to repaint minis after I'm finished with them, but we'll see how I feel after a while. Um, it's just, it's a little too bright, and maybe some people want that. I think it kind of gives that old school, second, third edition vibe to it, um, which may or may not be your intended effect. But I will recognize and acknowledge that my color matching was not spot on with this one. After the wash dried, I start on the yellow pauldron bands, Aquila, and other bits. The reliquary and skull on the helmet were intended to be gold, but I, I, something about this color scheme uh, just really pushed my limits for mixing gold and yellow. Something about having those next to each other on a model this already colorful and complex makes my brain shut down and rapidly fill with an irrational anger, so you'll have to tolerate my liberties here. I like the extremely eye-destroyingly bright yellow of Citadel's new Bad Moon Yellow contrast. So instead of painting yellow, I usually opt to paint white and then tint it with that, uh, that yellow, like usually like two layers. For the spots, like the reliquary with some recesses, I gave it a little dot of diluted brown wash to give it a little pop. From there, it was a matter of putting some brown wash over the pouches. In this case, a little bit of Army Painter Strong Tone. Then I opted to use decals uh, because it was 6 in the morning and I did not have it in me to freehand this shit. Um, and history is repeating itself because I am recording this at 6 o'clock in the morning. My immediate opinion of the paint scheme is good, but not quite there. Even though the source materials vary greatly, I think it's just a tad too bright. To me, I think a stronger wash or that dot of dark gray in the base coat would have really nailed the color. And I know you could buy a color that is this straight out of the pot, but I already have a lot of paints. I'm trying not to buy more, and I'm trying to get better at matching paint, uh, specifically color matching and mixing that. Uh, while I could also complain about compiling the gold components into the yellow as well, and yes, that is a legitimate complaint, you're valid. I feel like there are so many colors on this marine already, it just really fucking cluttered it. So yes, I will acknowledge that this is not my best color match, but I don't know. I still kind of like it. Like I said, it gives that second edition energy. I, uh, I should have put it on a goblin green base, honestly. But yeah, cool chapter. Uh, if you really liked City Fight, I feel like this is one, this is one for you. The world calls for wet work. We answer. No greater good. No just cause. Cypher sent us to hell. But we're going even deeper. I know. I'm already a demon. Alright, there's not a lot to this one, so we're gonna go over it pretty quick. No, I'm just kidding. No, this is We're gonna be here a while, so buckle up. The Ashen Claws are the second successor chapter of the Raven Guard on this list. Well, I use chapter loosely here. They are a chapter, but not a chapter in the modern sense. See, the Ashen Claws were a chapter, but not in the grimdark future. Oh, no, 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 no. They operated in the Great Crusade. The original members of the Ashen Claws were of the 19th chapter of Terranborn Astartes in the Emperor's Galactic War to claim all of the Milky Way in the name of humanity. 
As the Big E carved his way through the stars with his newly engineered Astartes force, he would give command of his legions to his long-lost sons, the Primarchs, as they were discovered. By the time the Primarch Corvus Corax had been reunited with the Emperor, the Great Crusade had been raging for over a century's time, meaning the original Ashen Claws were genuinely some of the first Astartes to ever come out of the oven. Fast forward to an indeterminate amount of time I didn't bother looking up, and War Master Horus had employed the assistance of the Space Wolves, Iron Warriors, and Raven Guard to quell a rebellion caused by worms in people's eyeballs that we'll gloss over entirely and you'll be thinking about for the rest of the video. The Raven Guard were to lead an assault in what would be known as the Battle for Gate 42. Despite being their leader, Corvus Corax was not very fond of the Battle Brothers recruited from Terra and so placed them in the Vanguard in a quiet attempt to have them killed off. The Raven Guard were successful in their efforts, although the losses had gone far beyond the initial Terran-born Vanguard, being the largest loss of troops the Raven Guard would have had before Istvan V, and just completely blew that record out of the water. Despite the slaughter at Gate 42, several Terran-born Legionnaires remained, angered by their Primarch's blatant disrespect for their service. However, Corvus, that little cunt wasn't done just yet. As part of a campaign to the section of space that would later become known as the Ghoul Stars, Corvus assembled a crusade fleet that, <laughs> you know, just so happened to contain all the surviving Terran-born Astartes. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> to them, they were dispatched, but to the Raven Lord, they were disposed of, thrown into the Ghoul Stars and cut off, left to succumb to whatever fate may have in store for them. Fast forward to the grim dark future, and what had happened to the Astral Claws had become known. The Astral Claws had survived 10,000 years, taking refuge in the Atragatus system, a barren realm under the light of a red sun named after a Phoenician goddess of transformation. That also kind of sounds like a Warframe drop you spent 30 hours grinding for. They had become pirates and raiders, striking out at imperial transports and extorting the local inhabitants for food and supplies. Now I know what you're thinking. Did I have the gall to sneak a Chaos Warband into this list of loyalists? Well, the Ashen Claws didn't embrace Chaos, but simply became renegade after denouncing the Great Crusade. Despite going renegade, they still somewhat have peaceful relationships with a certain Space Marine chapters, the Carcharodons in particular. The Carcharodons, as is their style of crusading, far beyond Imperial supply lines, occasionally go to the Ashen Claws homeworld of Atragatus Prime to trade supplies for raw recruits and slaves. This is known as the Red Tithe, a critical component of an ancient pact between the two forces. This pact sees to the survival of both forces, the Ashen Claws making out with munitions and supplies, and the Carcharodons gaining recruits to replenish their forces with. While there is a lot more on the Ashen Claws, and I mean a lot more on the Ashen Claws, this is already the longest section of the video, so I'm moving on to the conversion. For this, I'm going to do something extremely unhinged, psychotic even. I'm going to convert Mark X Assault Intercessor armor into Mark II Crusade armor. And I know what you're thinking. Just give me a second. You're thinking, why not just 3D print a Mark II body or buy one? Well, one, are you even aware of the true depths of my madness? The brittleness of my sanity? And two, I really just wanted to give it a try, you know? For the process, I use combined milliput and green stuff, which I'm really just falling in love with, by the way. I just, it, it does whatever I want it to. Uh, I trim as much of the armor details down, taking care not to cut through the inner void, like, of the inside of the model. Which I did do a few times, but uh, I just filled them back in with some loose sprue. From there, I just began layering on the Mark II's distinct segmented layers of armor. Uh, while I work, I wanted to take a, a fast talk detour to talk armor history and why I'm breaking my balls for a Mark II instead of just using this shitty recasted Mark III I got from... Actually, where did I get this from? What the fuck? 
The Mark II was the first uniform armor used in the beginning of the Great Crusade. It was fully powered and sealed against vacuums, and it was widely believed in the Imperium to be the first power armor ever used by humanity. The armor was considered extremely effective, its defenses outmatching even modern power suits. Although the armor was notably noisy, probably due to the grinding metal plates, and very hard to maintain due to its construction. When the Great Crusade reached the planets of the Squat Empire, they were noticeably getting their asses kicked in the tight corridors of the underground cities. This caused the Imperial engineers to lighten the plating of the armor's rear and focus more mass towards the front, developing the Mark II Crusade armor into the Mark III Iron variant. While the Mark II is more balanced against an all-round threat in open spaces, the Mark III has notably weaker armor on the flanks, but can withstand devastating firepower from the front, enabling humanity to conquer the squats and reboot them into a model line I don't really care for. The Mark III was not meant to replace the Mark II, as it was extremely loud, chunky, and had a much less generalist approach to its design, making the Mark III a specialist suit of armor for close quarters encounters. If that sounds familiar to you, then you'd be right, as the Mark III was integral for the foundations for the first Terminator armor patterns. Thanks, squats. Not you. Anyways, sorry about that rant. You guys know... I like giving insight for my design decisions. Uh, I just didn't mean for it to be that insightful. So let's get back to the model. For this particular model, I opted to work as much as I could with the pieces separated, particularly the legs, both for maneuverability, so I'm not waiting for putty to dry, you know. I started with the plate that goes on the bottom of the quote unquote armor stack, or the segments. In this case, the points furthest from the knee on both the upper and lower leg. From there, it was just a matter of laying on the next armor layers, taking care to straighten the edges. This particular putty mix sands very well, so after trimming all the edges with an X-Acto knife, I also sanded the surfaces and each edge, um, and it holds an edge beautifully. Like, <laughs> this, shit's, this shit's great, dude. When the both legs were done, I combined them and worked on the torso, starting from the abdomen up. After adding a small gorget and a little, uh, I don't know, USB adapter, <laughs> car adapter, whatever, the body was done besides the rivets. I debated on whether or not I felt like trying to roll out 300, like, tiny uniform balls, uh, and I eventually did, but they're just a little too big. But for now, I moved on to uh, slapping the other bits onto the body. In this case, we steal a recasted Mark III power pack and helmet and use these blue recasted Mark IV bits I got from... Seriously, where the fuck did this come from? I didn't buy this. The rest of the bits went on as is with a small wrist modification on the right arm, but I notably altered the Mark III head. The standard Mark II helmet is almost identical in every sense to the Mark III helmet, except the eyes, which are a visor. Uh, this was a very easy alteration. I just cut out the segment between the eyes and smoothed it all out. This is 100% not a reasonable option for any large-scale modeling, but as I said, as a converter sculptor guy, uh, not only did I want to push my skills, but also uh, flex. <laughs> no, no, no. But for real, there are a large number of third-party kits for Mark II armor since Forge World had discontinued their kit years ago. I know uh, Tortuga Bay had the most popular Mark II kit, if I remember correctly, but given the current state of foreign relations, they might not be selling for a while. Regardless, I'll link their website down in the description and any good STLs I happen to find. Will also be down there, and of course the Ashen Claws pauldron uh, that'll all be down there. Painting the Ashen Claw Marine was fairly similar to the Black Dragon, starting from a dark gray, dry brushing medium gray, then spots of light gray on the highest points. I darkened some red down with just a tiny dot of dark gray to make a slightly desaturated red, which I used on the pauldrons and also both vambraces, excluding the elbow guards. 
The elbow guards are known as Coulters. Uh, thank you again to the Red Wings video for helping me remember the name of that armor piece. Finally, with the red painted on and the Ashen Claw's mysterious symbol based in light gray, I tried something a little different. I mixed Army Painter Brown Wash with the new formulation of Nuln Oil with some glaze medium to help smooth out the mixture, and I gotta say, I'm a big fan. Uh, this is fairly similar to the Marine Juice quote unquote, that Sonic Sledgehammer demonstrates, which is apparently an old recipe the Forge World painting teams used to use, but my mix isn't the same ratio, and it's not quite the same in general. Still, it works pretty well as a universal wash. I'll have to play around with it some more. I will once again say that this level of conversion is just simply not reasonable for anything more than an HQ or a display piece, or like at most a squad of like five guys. Burgers and fries. I think it came out pretty great though. Uh, my rivets are gigantic compared to a normal model of rivets since I didn't have any material to punch out better ones and I was just rolling it and you know, whatever. So my rivets don't look like rivets. They look a little more like the repair studs found on like Mark V suits of armor. But in general, I'd say it was a success though. I completed all of these minis before the Nova reveals showed ARF, ARF, showed ARF, <laughs> showed ARF the new Mark III, <laughs> and given the close relationship between the two armors, I thought it was some really spooky timing. Um, I'm glad I went back and did do the rivets though. Uh, even though they're a little big, it looked a little empty without it. But yeah, love it. Might be my favorite conversion in the series so far in terms of raw sculpting, but again, please don't do this in large quantities or you will probably kill yourself and then I'd be to blame and I'm not going back to prison, guys. I'm not doing it. Okay, just to clarify, I've never been to prison. Okay, next one. You see, nobody ever goes in. Nobody ever comes out. The Iron Lords are an Iron Hands successor that I thankfully do not have to write a novel for, unlike the Ashen Claws. They date as far back as the 5th edition Space Marine Codex and have amassed many honors in notable campaigns. The Iron Lords have shed the blood of many Xenos, the Tau, genetic mutants, two different Tyranid Hive fleets, yet despite all of this, this chapter is known for their very careful involvement with one Xeno race in particular. On the eastern fringe of known space is a sector of space called the Grendel Stars. Deep within this cluster of stars lurks a race of Xenos known as the Bargizi, a hyper-violent and powerful alien race. Such is their power that while the Dark Eldar raid everyone else, the Bargizi raid the Dark Eldar. The Iron Lords have enforced an Iron Curtain on the Grendel Stars to contain the Bargizi from escaping into other systems, a duty they have been fulfilling without fail since the 38th millennia. The Ordo Xeno theorizes that if the incoming High Fleet tendrils were to gain the genetic data of the Bargizi, the entirety of the Eastern Fringe could be lost without fail. Even though the Iron Lords have received Primaris reinforcements, their main duty is to enforce their quarantine, having waited in vain for an extermination fleet to finally relieve them of their duty. The very, very first thing I need to define is what a fucking Bargizi is, as that'll influence the kind of trophies I can put onto the model. Being a minor faction with no pictures anywhere online, a phenomena I am becoming increasingly intimate with, I go with what I know. The name Bargizi sounds like the plural form of Bargest, a creature from Northern English folklore. It is described as a ghost or goblin in the shape of a large dog that is an omen of bad luck, very reminiscent of the fate of the galaxy if the Tyranids were to ever gobble up the bastards. If we look at Google Im- Jesus Christ, I hate fate so much. But anyways, if we look at Google Images, we can see that yes, indeed, the general non-weeb shit consensus of a Bargus seems to be some kind of ugly goblinoid werewolf which may be undead to some degree? Got it. The reason that this is an important decision now is that one day I want to cover the Bargizi as a minor Xeno faction in its own video. 
So settling on some stuff now will help us down the road when the time comes. For now, we'll play it safe with a simple fur pelt tabard. As with the magma hounds from the last video, I opt to use stiffened paper as the armature to sculpt the fur pelt on. Nothing complicated here, just stiffen the paper with super glue and sculpt right on it. The Iron Lords are an Iron Hand successor, which by default means that I am completely dick out when it comes to bits, so I'm gonna have to improvise. Honestly, like most people, I forget the Iron Hands even exist a lot of the time, except that one time where their rules were so busted that every meta chasing Luddite bought an Iron Hands army and then immediately sold it when it was nerfed. My best cybernetic prosthetic is the ever reliable Assault Intercessor Plasma Pistol, but I'm going to opt to not use it since I just used it for the Red Wings. Instead, I'll forego visible cybernetics for a more tactical, cautious look using the arms for this uh, Intercessor kit. I see the Iron Lords as the very meticulous type given the importance of what they guard. This particular marine is consulting his equipment, possibly scanning the area for any leftover Bargeezy looking to escape quarantine. Besides swapping the head with this Mark 7 helmet with like a little eye scope and scanners and attaching some pauldrons, the model didn't quite read as iron handsy as I wanted it. To me, the iron hand aesthetic needs some cables, and the best way I can think of doing that is a servo skull, but I don't have a servo skull. I grabbed a human skull from my bits and began to make my own servo skull. To make it easier to work with, I mounted it on some spare sprue, and uh, from there it was just a matter of layering on a little metal skull plate, an eye scanner scope thing, and some holes for some future metal probe antenna thingies. For the cables, I used both paper clip and some old guitar string. I wanted to make sure the servo skull was secure, so I bend the cables to not only imply a motion of the skull floating by, but I also find two points along the cables that I can mount it to to provide stability. As a final touch, I salvaged some bits from this uh, Adeptus Mechanicus backpack, namely the camera, the sensor, and antenna bits to season the model to taste. With all the small bits glued on, it was looking a little better in my eyes. I originally had wanted to give him a cybernetic leg, but I didn't want it to interfere with the paint job's color distribution. Speaking of... We are once again painting black armor. I really didn't intend for three chapters today to share a predominant color. In fact, I've tried to get a range of colors to show off to avoid this situation, but I guess this time around didn't really work out, so... Regardless, dark gray, dry brush medium gray, spots of light gray, you get it. After that I used the same desaturated red I used on the Ashen Claws for the helmet stripe and the Iron Lord's signature big red pants. Avoiding as much of the kneecap as possible so I wouldn't have to paint over the dry brushing I've already done there. Normally at this point I dry brush highlight the red, but for an army's worth, I genuinely think it'd be fine for rank and file guys. You've got a color and you've got it washed, like it's panel lined, you know, I think that's fine. After painting some gold bits on the chest and the servo skull and all the other little random metallic silver bits, everything was washed with the leftover marine juice knockoff mixture. It really did wonders on this mini, like it panel lined the red legs like perfectly. I was genuinely taken aback by how well this came out. Speaking about something that came out very well, let me talk about something that didn't. Uh, these close, Some of these close-up shots are a little overexposed, and I apologize for that. I didn't realize my phone settings were wonky, but uh, I'll do what I can in editing to make these a bit more palatable for your gentle eyeballs. The Iron Lords are a chapter I'm really fond of now, uh, and that's speaking as someone who generally doesn't give a shit about the Iron Hands at all. Um, but I really like, really, really, really like the Iron Lords. Uh, I love that their entire purpose is to guard one specific sector and one specific miner's, you know, like it's 
simultaneously minor in the grand theater of war, but could have unprecedentedly awful reprogressions if they fail. I'm also a fan of their paint scheme, mainly because I find the pants funny, but it's part of the charm to me. Um, I don't know if I would personally choose this pattern for any of my own armies, but I wouldn't change it for them with a gun to my head. But uh, yeah, I really like the Iron Lords. Um, I like the relationship with the Bargeezy, and not only am I looking forward to focusing more on that dynamic in a future video if I ever get around to it, but uh, you bet your ass I will be breaking out this mini for that video. <laughs> so yeah, I'm kind of future-proofing myself, or fucking myself over, I don't know. But uh, he'll be there. <laughs> Oh, that's too bad, bud. But at least you have people to want to come and visit you. My family hasn't been to see me since my trial. You eat nine people and all of a sudden they don't know who you are anymore. Wait. What? Making the list as the second Salamander successor here and the only one of the Ultima founding, the bulk of the Dragon Spears are comprised of Primaris Space Marines. While young, the fleet-based chapter has already proven itself as valuable allies of much older and venerable chapters, uh, the Space Wolves in particular. They participated in the Prosper and Rift War when Demon Primarch Magnus the Nerd-ass Bitch sought to establish a Psyker Kingdom, deploying eight entire companies to the war effort. They also answered Oaths of Brotherhood with the Space Wolves during Gazgul Thraka's Great Wog during the Psychic Awakening, being notably skilled in greenskin combat. I imagine a strong friendship between the Dragon Spears and Space Wolves blossomed over the years, given how often they seem to hunt the same prey. Or maybe the Dragon Spears are simply simping for the Sons of Rus. Who knows? Their parent chapter, the Salamanders, had been kept in the dark about their inception, as well as the inception of other Ultima founding successors. So when they discovered that more of Call's little bastards were running amok, the Salamanders quickly sent out one of their chaplains to teach them the ways of the Promethean cult. This did take a while considering that they were fleet based, and by the time they got a hold of them they found that they had already developed a very strong chapter culture and identity. You know, it's based on cannibalism, but you know, the small details. Okay fine, it's not a small detail, I'll explain it. The Dragon Spears preserved the memories of their fallen allies after their untimely demise through the use of their gene seed. The Omophagia is an organ implanted in Astartes that is implanted into the spinal cord, although it is technically an auxiliary brain in a sense. From there, a bundle of nerves connect to the stomach lining through the Omophagia, then into the Astartes brain. This special connection allows a space marine to literally learn with their stomach, consuming portions of a creature to gain some of their memories. The Dragon Spears utilize this spinal brain to inherit and thus preserve the strongest memories of their fallen battle brothers. As you can tell, I'm not fat, I'm big brained. For this conversion, I wanted to put the spear in Dragon Spear and also accentuate their propensity to preserve history. Given that one arm will be holding a spear, I thought using this pointing hand bit would, you know, be appropriate. This is a bit from the old three-man pack of easy-to-build intercessors. Not quite venerable, but still has a bit of nostalgia to me. I've been saving this bit for years, and I'm finally on a project where I think I want to use it on. However, the pauldron that's molded on interferes slightly with how wide I want the arm sticking out, so I carefully chop off the pauldron and stick a new one on. I fill the new arm gap with green stuff, cutting in a few lines to differentiate between the armor plates and the undersuit joints. And now the spear. I had debated on how I wanted to go about doing this, but I simply didn't have anything I thought would look reasonable for a sergeant. I opted to take a halberd from the Grey Knight's box and combine it with this Assault Intercessor grenade throwing arm to give me a wide commanding pose. However my autism kicked in, this halberd has a single, flat-edged blade similar to a machete that, while you could technically thrust with it, spears generally don't look like this. 
I opted to do some heroic scale bladesmithing. Sharpening the flat back and refining the tip into a proper spear shape. I've done a few of these small blade work like projects in the past and my general advice is to get the silhouette down first then carefully cut the majority of the profile down into a similar thickness to the pre-existing side of the blade then sand it lengthwise as if you were sharpening a knife since I mean I guess, I guess technically you are. This leaves me with a blade that looks much more spear like than just stapling an entire Grey Knight halberd onto the midi, which I feel like I could have gotten away with, but I don't cut corners here in the lab, except all the times I do, which don't count, so don't count them. With the spear done, I stuck it onto the model. Now spears are generally regular offenders to snapping and breaking, so I wanted to minimize the chance of mine being damaged. The pose I had chosen allows for the bottom of the shaft to connect with the side of the foot, right near the little ball of the ankle. Gluing the wrist as well as this foot connection with plastic glue completes the triangle of power, making this uh, surprisingly sturdy as fuck. The spear tip could still snap if handled roughly, but I'll take any bit of durability I can. Besides stapling on the belt bits, helmet, and pauldrons, one thing I wanted to do is visualize the chapter's culture of memory preservation, mainly because I don't think you can really model a spine implant. I mean, if you can, let me know, please. But I chose to do this by giving the mini a few purity seals. Seeing as purity seals have anything from blessings to deeds to oaths to... I don't know, the menu at fucking Denny's read it on them. I think it could be plausible that they would collect a few purity seals after giving their comrade the old <laughs> I scattered a few around trying to make sure the flow of the paper is somewhat matching in the direction of the wind. I also put on an orc skull and jawbone trophy, including stealing old Pete the Wargamer's nail it in the power pack placement. It's not stealing, it's an homage. Speaking of old Pete, we need to talk about painting these fuckers, because I've got some beef. Now I have a request for you guys. Tell me what fucking color this is. Don't cheat. Just tell me. Actually, this is a video, and you can't respond without looking crazy, so don't do that. According to the fandom wiki, this is light green. Light green? What the fuck is wrong with you people? I'm no color guru, but wh what? Pete the Wargamer was also on the right track for his conversion, but not quite there to me. I used a color picker and grabbed the mid-tone for this picture, and it has a hex code of, mm, yeah, I guess I'll read it, 566869, placing it firmly in the desaturated teal area. Pete's Dragon Spear is much more saturated, which, you know, that's fine, it's a style, but the base color doesn't read as the same as this reference picture. After a little experimenting, aka a complete shot in the dark, I mixed neutral gray and blue green together, which I felt was a pretty good color match for the base coat. For highlights, I combined that mix with a light gray, one to one, for dry brushing, then a final layer of just straight light gray. I used a dark gray for the pouches, and then a stripe down the center of the helmet. Afterwards, I traced out the Dragon Spear's heraldry on the pauldron and freehanded it. Like I said earlier, this is the only chapter on the list that didn't have a good looking pauldron to 3D print. The symbol is so simple, so I felt confident in my ability to freehand it, but I forgot to double check my lines and it ended up a little bit off center. So, for the wash stage, I mixed new known oil old Drakenoff Nightshade, and some glazed medium, much akin to the marine juice I mentioned earlier, and it left me with a really pretty desaturated blue after washing the mini. It almost perfectly matches the shade of blue used for Giver 1, particularly from the 2005 anime. The 86 OVA is pretty close too, just not as consistently. With the armor in a really good spot, I moved to an experiment on the blade. I've done a non-metallic blend on power swords before, but I wanted to see if you could do that with sponging. I masked off 
two sides of the blade to make sure sponging was easier. But overall, I'd say it's a little more trouble than it's worth. Like, technique-wise, it's pretty much the same. Keep the paint thin, build up layers, do a little glaze if you need to, but I don't know. I think it'd be better to pretty much just do a regular blend. Probably wouldn't take much longer. Uh, it's not much more work. I mean, I like my sponged on galaxy sword effect I use on other models, like my sorcerer. But yeah, I'm at least glad I tried. But after that, it was just a matter of painting in the gold, red, bone, and then washing it all brown. I don't know if red and gold are the best colors for this color scheme, but it's pretty quote-unquote standard for Imperial weaponry. Seeing as I've got Giver on the mind, I'm kind of leaning towards a muted purple and a silver to really sell the color scheme. It's a bit non-standard, but <laughs> I don't know. You could say I'm out of control. <laughs> Get it? Because Giver out of control. <laughs> Despite the fact that nobody can agree on the color of the Dragon Spears, I think I personally got closest to the Codex picture. Uh, not that the other interpretations are bad, except the wiki. What the fuck is wrong with you people? But given that I matched a color drop sample directly from that source, I don't think you can be more direct than that. Uh, I really also uh, love how the wash settled on this model. Like, wow, it just settled in those recesses perfectly. I forget how good of a result you can get by just adding a tiny drop of glaze medium into your wash. Uh... And hopefully, my walnut brain will remember to do that down the line. And that was five successor chapters for the Shattered Legions. Uh, two Raven Guard successors, two Salamander successors, and one for the Iron Hands. Um, might have been a bit biased in that choosing there, but I, I have to admit, I really do like the Iron Lords. They're, they, they've got a lot of... Uh, charm, like setting specific charm to them. I feel like the black dragons could be really cool if you like jump packs and like doing conversions but not like a lot of conversions. Like you really just need to make like little spikes and stuff to put around. So I, you know, combined with the easy paint scheme I think that's a really good chapter to try uh, sculpting if you're new to it I guess. You know it's it's minimal work and the painting is quick, so you can get results quick. Necropolis Hawks, I really like their their color scheme, and, you know, I joked on their uniform. But, like, it's cool to see that level of detail. The Ashen Claws could be really cool if you've got, like, a bunch of, you know, like, old Mark IV, Mark V, like, any, like, Mark II to Mark V kits just sitting around. You want to bash them together into something. Um, I think there's a lot of cool kit bashing potential there. And I've seen some really cool conversions on Instagram as well. And the, the Dragon Spears, um, I think mainly just the color. Like, I, I really like the color I settled on. You know, I feel like you get some really cool conversions out of there. You know, like increasingly complex dragon motifs as, you know, you go from troop to captain. Or fuck it, you know, just go all in. Do the black dragons <laughs> with... Uh, you're the bone spikes coming out of the arms. Paint one, Giver one blue. Paint the other one, Giver three black. And just say, fuck it. Uh, it's time for Giver. <laughs> uh, I really like Giver, if you couldn't tell. But yeah, I know these uh, exit monologues are never scripted, so I'm not going to keep it too long. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I had a lot of fun with this one. Also, a special shout out to Miss Josie Sollers over at Fiverr. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just had the idea in my head. I was like, man, I want to do like a breaking news story. So I was like, you know what? I'll check Fiverr. Like, I never check Fiverr for anything. And uh, I found her, and she was really cool to communicate with and very nice and friendly. Um, and she gave me pretty much exactly what I asked for at a decent, reasonable price. But I will link Josie's Fiverr link down in the description below. The description is just going to be fucking packed this time. But, uh, you know, hey, them's the breaks. So, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you feel like I deserved it, can, you know, I'd really appreciate your sub uh, or a comment. I try to answer every single one of them. Um, it's becoming a little increasingly difficult to do so, but I will still try my best. Um, you can find me on Instagram. 
Um, I kind of forget I have it sometimes, but I'll try to post more work in project pictures there to like teasers for you guys. And if you think I deserved it or you want to help out, consider dropping me a small tip on Kofi. Uh, again, you guys have a good one. I'm going to go... Uh, I feel like I had something important planned, but I forgot. But whatever. I'm doing this narration at 7.30 in the morning. It's taking me two hours to do this because I keep fucking it up. So I'm going to bed. Good night.